The Night Beat starts right now. Is it standard practice or questionable spending? Tonight, the defenders take a look into thousands of dollars CPS Energy spent on executive housing. That defender's investigation coming up. And three local law enforcement officers accused of turning against the badge. The case is against them just ahead. Plus, shots fired and a truck takes off. San Antonio police revealing what led up to a shooting that left a woman dead Monday afternoon. But first. We want to get you to some breaking news out of Ukraine. A nuclear power station shelled by Russian troops is on fire tonight. Ukraine's president is urging Russia to cease its military activities to allow firefighters and emergency responders access to that site. It is reportedly the largest nuclear power plant in Europe. The White House says President Joe Biden is also urging a ceasefire and is speaking with the administrator of the U.S. National Nuclear Security Administration. We'll continue to keep you updated on this situation as it develops. Also, this just into our KSAT newsroom tonight. New photos released of a 10-year-old girl missing since yesterday. Cassandra Torres's father and stepmother shared this photo in hopes of finding her. She was last seen on Sabina Street, just west of San Antonio. Police believe she may be with her biological mother who does not have custodial rights. If you know where she is tonight, call the number there on your screen. It's 210-207-7660. New tonight, it is the latest questionable spending by CPS Energy, and its leadership was in no mood to talk about the subject with the night team's Dylan Collier. Our investigation found the utility spending hundreds of thousands of dollars on what the utility calls transitional housing payments for some current and former executives. CPS's vague answers and what we found happening at other public entities in tonight's Defenders Report. <laughs> The LinkedIn pages of former Chief Information Officer Karen Kerwin and one-time utility CFO and Treasurer Dolores Lindsay-Jones show that each spent less than two years working for CPS Energy. Yet, somehow, the briefly tenured pair was given a combined $102,000 for transitional housing, topping the list of current and former executives who have received this benefit since the start of 2015 a benefit that has cost you, the ratepayer, in excess of $213,000. If you try to hire an executive from outside of the city, you want them to move here, this is moving expenses, this is um, a place to live until you can find a place to live. But District 1 City Councilman Mario Bravo, a member of the Municipal Utilities Committee, believes the sheer dollar amounts attached to some of these executives are worth exploring. That's up there. Yeah, that's up there. It, it's, uh, I mean, it's something that they should have to explain. Getting CPS Energy to explain it has been easier said than done. After we sent repeated interview requests via email, a utility spokeswoman said they weren't interested in putting someone on camera to defend what she called a standard practice. But is it standard? Records obtained by the defenders show the city of Bryan, which runs a public but much smaller power company, doesn't cover housing costs for any utility executives or city employees for that matter. The city of San Antonio, which has a workforce nearly four times the size of CPS, does offer to cover housing costs for some executive level positions, but typically caps that amount at $16,000. Bear County, which also has a significantly larger workforce than CPS, has offered to cover housing costs just once the past decade and caps that amount at $6,000. We attempted to catch up with CPS Energy Interim President and CEO Rudy Garza as he left a recent Utilities Committee meeting, but he didn't seem thrilled to make our acquaintance. Rudy, can we ask you real quick about the transitional housing figures I'm that were released gonna, to us? I'm not going to talk, talk about that. Please don't touch yeah. me. I'm not gonna <laughs> don't put your hands on me. Um, you've already done what to us? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not going to talk about that issue. I think, okay. we, I think we've given you the information. But you haven't, though. You haven't answered any questions other than to say it's transitional housing. You know, the figures kind of jump out. 57000 for a former CIO, 44000 for... I'm sorry, Mr. Garrison, I'm taking any statements right now. He's got a meeting he's got to get to. Sorry. And with that, he was gone. The release of records on housing payments comes just months after CPS Energy handed over receipts showing one of its other former executives routinely charged multiple meals a day on his corporate credit card. 
including group dinners that sometimes top six or seven hundred dollars. For Bravo, it's time for an appropriate limit on housing costs to be put into place. I've seen much higher, um, but I think we still need to look at what is an appropriate cap for San Antonio. For the Defender, Dylan Collier, KSAT 12 News. CPS officials have given no indication whether a cap on housing costs currently exists. Four of the eight executives who appeared on the list still work for the utility, including its current chief information officer, a senior director, and two vice presidents. New tonight, police investigating another case of child abuse that turned deadly, this one happening west of San Antonio in Hondo. Police say they have a person of interest in that case and are awaiting autopsy results. The interim police chief for Hondo, Ray Lacey, says they responded to the call on Valentine's Day for a one-month-old baby that wasn't breathing. That child had to be airlifted to a hospital here in San Antonio where the child later died. We'll continue to keep you updated on this case as more information comes in. A relationship takes a turn for the worse. Police releasing new details in Monday's afternoon, Monday afternoon's deadly shooting. Investigators say 54 year old Enrique Lara is accused of killing Maria Hernandez, a woman he sent flowers to. Police say Hernandez was dropped off at work near Inner Park Boulevard and West Avenue before she was shot. Officers say Lara sent flowers and a card to Hernandez's workplace, but they were thrown in the trash. Lara's family told police he admitted he, quote, had done something bad, he now faces a murder charge in that case. An entire school district's fleet of day-to-day -day operation vehicles are out of commission tonight because their catalytic converters were stolen. 15 different vehicles were targeted in all. The night team's John Paul Barajas takes a look at how that small district of Lytle plans to keep things running. One by one, Lytle District employees loaded 14 day-to-day -day operation units onto a trailer, strapped them in, and took them into an auto shop to get fixed. All of their catalytic converters stolen. The 15th vehicle was a bus that had to be taken somewhere else, crippling the small 3A district, according to the Director of Operations, William Cross. We don't have any fleet vehicles that we could send uh, any district personnel out to any uh, events that they may have on the schedule. And then for our maintenance guys in my department, uh, that puts us in a bind to we're not able to get out throughout the district to service the facilities, whether we've got a plumbing leak or an electrical issue. All but two of their fleet vehicles are out of commission. Luckily, student transportation to and from schools won't be affected, but school clubs, inventory deliveries, and taking care of the campuses will be hindered. But of course, it's difficult to carry a lot of tools uh, when you're on foot. This gate was left unlocked, according to the director of operations, and because of that, the suspect was able to open it and drive through it, getting to the back of the operations yard. Now, once they were back here, they used wire cutters to cut through the fence, and that's when they were able to get inside and steal all the catalytic converters coming in and out for about three hours. The fellow that, that broke in, it looked like one person, looked like an Anglo male, small build. Uh, this was not like a crime of opportunity, I don't think. I mean, this was something that the person had, you know, knew what they were, they planned on probably doing what they did. Lido Police Chief Richard Priest explained, the suspect was methodical in hitting essentially every vehicle. The total cost of damages is yet to be determined, depending on vehicles' parts availability and shipping. Cross believes it'll be tens of thousands of dollars. Anything you'd like to say to the individual responsible? Not that I could say on camera. Now, Cross says they are looking at potentially adding upgraded security cameras, but that would also cost money. And as for the suspect, what would have been a misdemeanor is now a felony as of last June when the crime of stealing catalytic converters was upgraded here in Texas. Tim. Thank you, John Paul. Let's take a look now at some of the other big stories of the day. Just northeast of San Antonio, two officers in Live Oak may face criminal charges, both accused of helping a woman avoid arrest while having a sexual relationship with her. Sergeant Jonathan Gann resigned today. Investigators say he ordered police not to take that woman into custody. Corporal David Wall resigned back in February. He's accused of giving the woman meds and possible illegal drugs and telling her the best location to buy drugs to avoid being caught by police. The sheriff in Dimmick County is facing his own troubles. 41 year old Marion Boyd is facing felony charges of stalking, tampering with a witness and tampering with evidence. He was arrested today. According to court documents, Boyd is accused of coercing a witness to stop an investigation back on August 16th. Two days earlier, investigators say Boyd allegedly tampered, tampered with evidence. And in April of last year, Boyd is accused of sending pictures of another man's genitals 
to a woman. Another step forward in a Riverwalk Hotel deal. The city already helped get the Grand Hyatt built on city owned land and covered some of the hotel's debt during the pandemic. This new deal would reimburse the city for the money it's put into the hotel and clear its debt obligations. What we've been brought today, Ben, I, I have to say, uh, can't be described anything other than a win win. Today, the city voted to allow an Arizona based nonprofit to buy the building. Grand Hyatt would then still operate the hotel. Once that deal is paid off, the city could gain back control. The deal still needs to be finalized, and that could happen by next month. And that's a look at your Nightbeat News Flash. Still ahead on the Nightbeat, an ongoing strike is not silencing musicians with the San Antonio Symphony. The project playing out tonight and the performance you can catch tomorrow. That's coming up. Plus, we are keeping an eye on the fire at that nuclear power station in Ukraine. We are now learning the fire has not affected essential equipment and plant personnel are trying to reduce risk from the flames, but still no word on a ceasefire. We'll bring you the latest updates on this developing situation next when the night beat continues. The Russian assault intensifying tonight inside Ukraine. Russian troops shelling Europe's largest nuclear power station in Ukraine. Ukraine's president calling on Russia to allow firefighters to extinguish those flames before it escalates. Tonight, the International Atomic Energy Agency reporting that Ukraine's regulator says there has been no change in radiation levels at the facility. President Joe Biden is also keeping an eye on the situation. Earlier today, Russian and Ukrainian officials held a second round of talks and have tentatively agreed to temporary ceasefires, but details are still currently being worked out. Oil prices continue to be impacted by that situation. The White House says the U.S. now in the process of tapping into strategic reserves of oil and hope we can see that reflected here at home soon. Right now, prices at the gas pump continuing to increase. The average right now in San Antonio is $3.33 a gallon. There are ways, though, to stretch your dollar. Experts say tire pressure that's too low can create drag and waste gas. Also, you want to check your air filters, a dirty one also hurts your mileage and when it's time to get gas you need to shop around apps like gas buddy or Waze can help you find the lower prices some gas stations also offer cash discounts for loyalty programs Musicians with the San Antonio Symphony doing something you have not seen since September of last year. That's when the musicians began their strike over cuts to staff and benefits. While that strike continues, musicians decided to perform under the support of First Baptist Church's First Fine Arts series. We spoke with some in tonight's audience who say they are happy to hear from San Antonio's talent once again. Just to hear the blend, live blend of all that instrumentation uh, you just can't get that digitally. No way to get that. And I love it. If you weren't able to make it out tonight, you do have another chance tomorrow. This will happen again at First Baptist Church on 515 McCullough Avenue right here in downtown. 100% of donations will go directly to the musicians and to cover production costs. Let's take a live look outside with live cam on this Thursday night. Taking a look at the Alamo out there all lit up. And 66 degrees, Adam, this time last week we were all freezing. We've had a taste of spring since then. A little hint of humidity today, too, out there. Yeah, and that humidity is going to be increasing over the next couple of days. And that's going to actually help lead to some damp mornings. So more fog to start the day tomorrow and every day through Sunday. And just overall dampness with drizzle. A bit of a taste of spring. Temperatures back into the 80s in parts of uh, South Texas. And a Monday cold front will change it all over again. All right, let's get right to it. Take a look at our day today and especially our drought monitor because we are in need of some rain. This is the newest drought monitor, of course, updated to every Thursday. Dimmit, LaSalle, McMullen counties, even even Maverick County. You get the idea. South and west of San Antonio is where we are in the most need of rain. We're in the deepest drought in that area and not just that part of Texas, but 
even the rest of the state could use some moisture. I mean, 80% of Texas is considered in drought right now, which has actually held pretty stable over the past couple of weeks. Nonetheless, I, I don't like seeing colors on this map. I like to see these colors wiped away. So let's talk about our weather pattern. A weak little ripple in the upper level flow moving through New Mexico, clipping parts of West Texas. Not much moisture associated with it. Pretty insignificant. A bigger dip in the upper level flow moving toward Los Angeles. Same one that was streaming that moisture into Washington and Oregon the past couple of days. This is going to drop into the southwestern US, get close to us, but not close enough to really give us any meaningful rainfall. It'll be followed by a few more disturbances. The up, these upper disturbances, they fall into the southwestern US. They just don't position themselves in the right spot to give us that good rain producing energy. We really need them to get down into northern Mexico. So here's just one way to look at it in terms of one computer model's prediction of rainfall or precipitation over the next six days. And you can see a lot of places actually getting some measurable moisture. West Texas, southern New Mexico, south central Texas, not so much, unfortunately. Our rain chance is about 30% Sunday night, and that's about it. 49 this morning, then a high temperature of 79 earlier today. Record high, 92, set back in 1901. Look at these dew points, mid 50s. This would be a relief in summertime, but compared to the very dry air we've had lately, we're starting to notice a hint of humidity in the air. And the key is the temperature is going to drop down to that dew point tonight. Once they meet, air saturated. We don't just get dew, but also fog and drizzle in this instance. So tomorrow morning, a damp start to the day. The nuisance dampness, the type that doesn't really add up to anything. It just gets in the way of the morning commute and you can't find the right windshield wiper setting that kind of dampness, the drizzle and reduced visibility. And you'll actually really feel the humidity as we get into Sunday with dew points in the 60s then. Right now, temperatures mostly in the 60s. Divine at 64, Converse 63, Bulverde at 60, Kerrville though down to 57. And tomorrow morning, I think most of us will be in the upper 50s. And then by the afternoon, we make it well into the 70s, even mid 80s, closer to the Rio Grande. I mean, Del Rio, Carrizo Springs, Catula, about 83, 84 for your high temperatures. Once we shake free from that morning fog and drizzle, we'll have some afternoon sunshine and a bit breezy as well. A southeasterly breeze up to about 10 to 20 miles per hour for the afternoon. We basically just repeat this every day all the way through Sunday with more widespread temperatures in the low to mid 80s on Sunday. Then that cold front hits. So Monday we're down in the lower 70s and windy. By Tuesday in the morning, we're closer to 40 degrees with a high temperature of 62. So a brief little taste of spring, then the cold front resets us and reminds us it's still March around here. Still early. Thank you, Adam. All right, uh, the Spurs back home, Greg, for the first time in nearly a month. How'd they do? Not good news, they <laughs> fall. But you know what? For me, I'm kind of glad because it gives Pop a chance to set or make, in this case, NBA history in front of a home crowd perhaps next week. When we come back, we'll show you how the Spurs fall to the Kings tonight at home for the very first time since February the 4th. And the Cowboy has very uncommon surgery. What does that mean to him coming up? Now we're just about ready to go. The marquee matchup is shipping in the middle. Turtle against the bonus. We gave it the number. Another milestone in the making in the AT&T Center tonight is the voice of the Spurs. Bill Schoening celebrates his 2,000 consecutive broadcasts of Spurs games. Congratulations, Philly Billy, on game day. Before tonight's tip off, the Spurs pay tribute to the people of Ukraine with a moment of silence for what they are having to endure right now. Tonight's game also marked the first time the Spurs have been in the AT&T Center since a rodeo road trip. After falling behind by as many as eight in the first quarter, Spurs finish strong. DeJounte Murray intercepts his pass, takes it right over former Spur Chimezi Metu for the bucket. Devin Vassell from the corner for the three, and the Spurs are down three after one. Lonnie Walker the fourth put the Spurs on his shoulders in the second quarter, knocking down consecutive threes to keep the Spurs close. Jakob Pertl 
comes up with a big time block to start this break. Trey Jones pushing it up the court, lobs it to Lonnie Skywalker for the alley oop. Lonnie with 22 of the Spurs, 50 points, but the Spurs don't make a basket in the final four and a half minutes. They're down by 13 at the break. Spurs fall behind by 19 before battling back. Josh Primo swats that shot. Zach Collins gathers it in, toss it ahead to Walker for the jam. Spurs go to the fourth on an 8 0 run, down only six. Spurs tie the game at 91 when Josh Primo slams his down. Spurs on a 17 3 run. Then they take their first lead of the game on DeJounte Murray's bucket, 99 97. Spurs down three with less than two seconds to play. Pirtle to DeJounte for the off balance three. It's close, but no cigar. Walker with a season high 30 points, but the Spurs fall 115 to 112. We played about a quarter and a half tonight, and that's disappointing. So, uh, you know, we, we have to take responsibility for that and be more mentally ready to go. Uh, and we can't play soft for half the game. That's the bottom line. There's really nothing else to, to say. All right, and here's our next matchup. Be on the road. Quick road trip to Charlotte Saturday at 6. Pro football coverage powered by Davis Law Firm. Blake Jarwin's future with the Dallas Cowboys now very much in doubt after the tight end underwent hip surgery last month and is not expected to be ready to kick off the 2022 season. Now that is according to the NFL Network that says the surgery is considered uncommon for an active NFL player. They're playing in just the first seven games last season, returning for only one more and missing most of the 2020 season after suffering an ACL tear in the first game of the season. It's not looking good. And when you consider Dalton Schultz as a free agent this year, the Cowboys may have to slap the franchise franchise tax on him. The NFL and NFL Players Association have agreed to suspend all COVID-19 protocols effective immediately and being able to navigate through the pandemic for the last two years. According to ESPN, all teams received a memo this morning, which is based on current encouraging trends regarding the prevalence and severity of the coronavirus. Most of the league's most severe requirements have been dropped by the end of last season. That included mandatory testing for asymptomatic players and staff, requirements to wear contact tracing devices, special distant rules in weight rooms and team cafeterias. Press conference today for the big fight card in the Alamo Dome next month. Details next. DAZN and Golden Boy Promotions held their official press conference to announce Ryan Garcia's next fight, which will be in the Alamo Dome on April the 9th. 23-year-old undefeated lightweight hasn't fought in over a year, but Garcia is anxious to get back in the ring in his return to Texas. You know, it's been over a year, uh, and it's been uh, it's been kind of like a roller coaster year, but it's so relieving to finally get my shot back in the ring and I feel good and I've never really felt better than this. Ryan Garcia is, is the next up and coming superstar in boxing and so to take him at, uh, at his young career um, and showcase him in front of the, uh, uh, the fans in, in, in San Antonio is, uh, will give us an indication of where Ryan Garcia is. Um, I do expect a sellout at the Alamo Dome. I think San Antonio has the best fans ever. Uh, it's it, it's, it's going to be exciting. We like to hear that. You can hear more from Garcia and Oscar De La Hoya Sunday on Instant Replay right after the night beat. The field for the Valero Texas Open continues to grow as we get close to tea time later this month. Today was announced that Tony Finau, the 20th ranked player in the world, will now join other world recognized pros as Jordan Spieth and Rory McIlroy at the JW Marriott TPC Resort Course as part of the 100th anniversary celebration of this tournament. Besides Finau also committing today, U.S. Open champion Graham McDowell, nine time tour champion Matt Kuchar will be part of the star studded field that will compete March the 31st until April the 3rd right before the Masters. And our San Antonio missions are partnering with the South Texas Blood and Tissue for a community blood drive this Saturday at the Wolf. Those who participate will receive a free game ticket and a Feeling Lucky t-shirt. Here's where it all takes place at the Wolf Stadium on Saturday from 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. So be there if you can. Sounds like a good deal. You got it. Thank you, Greg. We'll be right back. It's being called the tastiest week in San Antonio. Black Restaurant Week is officially underway. The event runs through March 6th and helps the San Antonio Food Bank. We have a list of restaurants that are participating online over at ksat.com. Finally tonight, take a look at this. Meet Percy the Puppet Porcupine. If he looks familiar, it might be because Percy was created by the same people who made the Muppets at Jim Henson's Creature Shop. The puppet is 20 feet by 20 feet and was made for the San Diego Children's Zoo. The zoo is set to open its new wildlife explorers base camp. Percy has about 2,000 custom made quills and weighs in at over a ton. Don't want to hug him. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs>
All right, temperatures tomorrow afternoon well into the 70s. Hondo, Castroville 78, Elmendorf 79. Meanwhile, Leon Springs and Timberwood Park about 75. I think all of us 80 degrees by this weekend. All right, thanks, Adam. Thank you for watching. That's all of our time. Good night. We'll see you tomorrow.